Questions are funny. Having specific questions can be a crutch, but they also help you get started. A few things can happen in that environment when you're not experienced. The key one is you focus so much on making sure you ask the questions in the order you've written them that you forget to actually actively listen to what's going on in the conversation. The challenge though, is if you haven't done a lot of this work, it's hard to do this without having questions. If you look at people who are experienced researchers, they often don't have <clears throat> a list of questions and I don't either. What I have is a list of topics and themes that I want to mm. cover because insights often don't live in a question. Insights live in the follow-up questions. Cause yeah. I might say something you're like, oh, that's interesting. I never, like you're thinking, I never thought of that. Hey, welcome to the Message Market Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Silvestri. And if you're new here, this is a show where I chat with B2B SaaS folks in marketing, product, growth, and founders about how they join the conversation already happening in their customers' minds. We dive deep into their thinking, their systems, and their playbooks to see how they empathize with their audience and speak to them in a way that resonates so they're compelled to take action. Join us and learn how you too can shape your messaging strategy and write copy that truly resonates and differentiates you. I am excited for my guest today, Ryan Paul Gibson. Ryan is the founder of Content Lift, where he helps B2B businesses run customer interviews that don't suck. In this episode, we chat about Ryan's learnings conducting over 1,900 interviews, the importance of buyer processes versus demographics, how to get busy executives to participate in research, and a lot more. Let's dive right in. Hey, Ryan. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You've conducted 1,900 interviews in your career, and you spent three years as a private investigator. So what's the big idea that you've gotten out of those from human behavior and human decision-making. Just to, I want to correct him. I was a reporter, not an investigator, but it's like the same thing, okay. right? In many ways. And we could talk a bit about like the process of investigation. Yeah. What's the big thing about human behavior? B2B is a bit different than how you're approaching compared to like just general human behavior. But I would say like, we're not really good predictors of our behavior. Mm. But we're very good at telling stories about things we did. So I try to use that as my superpower for understanding how I'm going to talk to people who are potential buyers, because if I can get a map of what the average story is, then I can use that to my advantage to influence the decisions of future buyers. I hope that I'm not sure if I answered your yeah, I hope that I like it. So apart from. Yeah, those in, insane experiences. How was it like speaking with 1900 people throughout your career? <laughs> Did you see, you start seeing patterns at some point that it became automatic, like to understand them? Yeah. I'm almost, <coughs> excuse me, almost at 2000 well, now. <laughs> okay, give me a count. There's a lot of things <coughs> that you pick up on as you, you do this work. A lot of it is muscle mm. memory to me now yeah. because I've done so yeah. many. And I think other people who, you're either investigators, do what I would call qualitative research, because that's really what I do. They see a lot of these similar patterns over and over again. But what I try to tell people is the patterns are more around biases and memory and, you know, how they interact with you in this specific contextual setting. Our job in the business world is to figure out what the patterns and themes are for your ideal buyer in the context of how they do things. So I separate the two. One is more about like human mm -hmm. psychology and the other is there every bar, every segment has patterns that they move through as they try to solve problems. And that's really where you, the rubber hits the road for marketers. So when I work with people either in person or I do work with them, there's things that I'm doing to manage biases on my own and on their side and as navigate the discussion. What I'm also trying to do is map out the patterns and themes and behaviors of people in a certain mm -hmm. segment. I, yeah, you, you mentioned something very interesting, which is people are solving prog problems, right? Um, and, and there's this whole idea yeah. in the jobs to be done philosophy of 
helping people make progress. So how do you think about that? Helping them solve their problem? How do you figure those out? Yeah. So jobs to be done is great, if, if, but it's just one methodology of trying to understand a market. There's mm -hmm. others. There's like the lean canvas startup community. A lot of people love category entry points now in the last year where it's, you're trying to understand how people move from in market from out of market mm -hmm. to in market. All those things are like shades of gray. If you ask me, it's not that there are another one is right or wrong. It's just this dance around the same things, which is that it's, if you talk to consumers, typically consumer products support a lifestyle or a, a preference of something. So an example I often like to give is the people who drink Perrier are not going to buy liquid death candle water because it supports a lifestyle. If I buy Honda motorcycles, I'm not buying, probably buying Harley Davidson. Like there, it's a lifestyle type of thing. In the business world, it's actually, it's all about processes because most businesses are an amalgamation of processes to get to an end state of something. But yes, jobs to be done is all about transition, but it's not one thing that helps them achieve an end state. Typically it's a few things that are all cobbled together. What is it to your question? I try to understand what are the large, what is the larger process that a buyer's trying to accomplish <clears throat> and what are all the things they're doing within that? I just actually just post about it today. Today is we're recording this in like, you know, mm. mid October and then my LinkedIn post, I talked about how with one client, I, they wanted to sell into long haul trucking operations, but they had no idea how that process worked from start to finish. So I was like, okay, let's go figure it out. And we figured it all out. Now product people will often do this or <clears throat> because they're trying to build the products around it. But marketers also need to understand this because that's the lens through which buyers start looking at their options in market, right? The same way that they would attach to liquid death or Perrier, they attach to things like, no, I'm a, I do, I'm an industrial food plant. And these are the ways I do these things. <clears throat> so <clears throat> these look like these are good options for me in market to improve these types of things that I do. Yeah. Problems are a key one to help because they all bubble up in pattern and themes, but you also need to understand like, how does that problem fit into a larger thing they're mm. trying to do? That was a long answer. Yeah, I apologize. No worries, I love it. That's, that's how I try to get at these things as yeah. a marketer. And I love especially the fact that you mentioned product because a lot of um, the work that I do as well as a conversion copywriter <laughs> is also to understand the perspective of the product team, sales, marketing, and try to mess them all together, yeah. right? Because when you write copy that sells, you also have to, I think, sell on the outcome of using the product. You have to set expectations for how the product is going to be used. So you have to understand yeah. the whole journey, right? Yeah. And if I may, just to, to, to add to that and getting back to like patterns and themes, here's something that I think is paramount now and based on all my work. Buyers evaluate things based on whether something looks credible, authentic, and relevant mm -hmm. to them. And you can't do that. You can't create copy or content or just messaging into a market if you don't understand what's how they view things that are relevant and credible. Like what is, how do they decide what's credible and relevant? Really good example. I've talked to people who have bought from cold outreach and we, we dump on cold outreach, but a lot of that's probably justified. But when you talk to people who have actually bought a solution from being reached when it's been through cold outreach and you ask them, walk me through your mindset here. What made you actually gravitate towards it? Oh, the subject line was a specific problem that was specific to me and all the other emails I get cold outreach, like is so irrelevant. It doesn't make any sense to me, but this was actually like used words that I recognize and spoke to my specific scenarios. So then I was interested and then I went out and I looked at it more and then it caught my interest, right? So <clears throat> this is how buyers look at things. Generic, we're going to help you increase your revenue. No one cares. We are going to help you fix that issue in your Salesforce CRM that's been plaguing people for the last two years. And this is the issue. That's specifics and relevance. And those are the things through which people look at stuff. Because if you don't understand that, Chris, like it's, you're going to be like, it's going to be really hard for you to get their attention and build mental availability yeah. with something. And those, um, 
made me think of when, for example, I'm doing some review mining, I'm looking at reviews and there's like a specific section of yeah. a review that clicks and it's basically copy that I could take like verbatim and add to the website because yeah. it just resonates so much. Yeah. Review mining is great. It's like, there's so many ways you can get data. I've done yeah. that before. Um, cause my focus is qualitative customer research or customer interviews, but it's just mm -hmm. one piece, right? There's other ways <laughs> you can get data faster to make decisions faster, um, or like just to round out how yeah. you're approaching things. All right. So I want to jump back a bit because we've had, you had an, an interesting background other than the investigative reporter. There's also, you've worked in the food service and hospitality in the franchising. So what did yeah. you carry from those industries, <clears throat> that industry? Yeah. I'm an elder now in B2B. I probably may not look like it. When I started in offices, you could smoke wow. inside of them. <laughs> Old school. We were, fax machines were what we used. So oh. it's, that's how long I've been doing this. <clears throat> the franchise industry was interesting because that business model, I actually, ha before I say that, I had the operations side of things. I was in the operations hat and <clears throat> I had a small marketing hat. They didn't really have an internal marketer. I was it holding the operations and it makes sense because you have to create the marketplace for the franchisees to succeed. That's the whole point of a franchise system. They're pumping, putting down $600,000 or whatever for almost instant mm. revenue, right? They want a low risk business investment. So your job as the franchise system is to create the marketplace for them to succeed. And a lot of it is like impulse buy, very brand driven. <clears throat> People who have never worked in consumer, the consumer world don't often don't understand how paramount research is market research, segmentation, buyer research, it drives all the decisions. And if you don't do it, you're out of your mind surfing, right? You're the outlier in B2B. It's almost the reverse. And <clears throat> I did it all myself because it's expensive, especially at the time. So to do things like surveys person on the street interviews, one-on-one -on -one conversations, <clears throat> competitor analysis. I used to go into the stores of my competitors, pretend I was a customer and start chatting people up in line. And some people thought I was out of my mind, but if I didn't understand how people made decisions about why he or not there, then how am I going to spend my resources and budget effectively to try and influence their decisions? I'm not, I'm just guessing. <clears throat> so I did every, I did all of that and I, what I learned in that environment was the ability to take research and then put it into action. Because when I, after I did all that for a year, <clears throat> I redid a lot of the stores, the queue, the services, how we branded ourselves. And I was able to increase same source store mm -hmm. sales and test locations by 40%, wow. which was huge. <clears throat> when I left that became a reporter and that's where I really cemented how I approach the process of investigation, which is a whole sort of methodology to it. And then I went back to the business world and it was, and I started B2B again, but <clears throat> this time working with software companies and technology companies, and it just blew my mind how much they did not know about their buyers and their businesses. They knew the specific problem, like the specific thing they wanted to solve, but they either had not done the validation of understanding what the market size was for it how they would talk about this in the market, how they would get the attention of these buyers or just map out like what these buyers are using and what they cared about. It's, it was insane. And some of these people were, had built, spent time building these things for six months to a year. So I've taken that approach of what I did in B2C and brought it to B2B. And sometimes they even get in trouble where I want to talk to say, I wanted to talk to a customer sales said no. So I just started calling people myself <laughs> in the CRM and man, did they ever yeah. get mad. How dare you talk to my customers, you're going to blow or how am I going to get you more people like this person if I can't understand how they make decisions? So yeah, it's B2B has a very strange sort of approach to research where it, you have to talk to a market, but marketers don't often get the keys to talk to the people that they need to yeah. understand. It's very, so I've been fighting that battle for the last 15 so years. Why <laughs> do you think that is, why is B2B that like far behind? Yeah. 
Let me ask you, have you experienced that? I, I, your, I find that SaaS companies, which I, I only work with SaaS companies, they probably a bit more aware in terms of doing research, conducting research yeah. and aligning departments. But in <laughs> general, I agree yeah. like B2B is probably uh, behind um, B2C in that regard. So to your question, I think there's a lot of reasons. Some of it is just because sales has been the, the lead for how you grow business in B2B for a long time. And I understand why that is. I don't think that's wrong. It just has been the way things work. Paul, there's a lot of mm. politics around who owns the customer. When in the consumer world, we have what we started to call like the four P's. It was a framework developed in the sixties, actually in the fifties and then raging in the sixties. The four P's often sits within marketing because of how consumer markets work. I don't want to take a broad podcast of that. In B2B, a lot of it is spread out because it's like price, promotion, product, and uh, place. Product is owned by a separate team in SaaS or another B2B companies. And the price as well, because some of these investments are hundreds of thousands of dollars. So finance wants to get involved and understand that, fair, make sure that our margins are covered. And I don't think that's wrong. It's just mm. how the model works. <clears throat> so there's a lot of politics around, though I own this part of it and I own the customer. So I've heard every reason and excuse in the book. Some of it is <clears throat> we don't think marketers will represent the company professionally, um, which is crazy. Um, you know, um, we don't want, we don't want to bother our customers. They have better things to do. No, well, not if they you have a relationship with them over years, they want to hear from you. They want to know that you're actually working to make their business better. It's business to business. So I've heard every excuse in, in the book. But if you, it really, any company that doesn't allow a marketing team to get in the minds of buyers is really, <clears throat> they're, you know, they're selling themselves short and they're going to make bad decisions with how they invest into their marketing sales programs. And just to talk about you, like, they're not going to find messages that actually resonate with the market. Yeah. And they're just going to spend money experimenting. People will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars A-B testing ads but they'll, they will let someone go and have a conversation for an hour. It's the same. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, since you mentioned that there's kind of lack of awareness as well, I was curious to ask, what's the reaction from your clients when they see your messaging of, we run customer investigations, which is like on the extreme opposite of things. Like we do it like professionally. This is like a serious thing. I mean, it depends who I'm talking to. If you talk to large organizations, they look at what I do. I'm like, oh yeah, you do market research. We outsource stuff like that. We have people who go to expert networks is often what they call them. I call them research recruitment mm -hmm. platforms. And there's hundreds of them, but people who I, you can book and you can get an hour on their calendar. You pay for their time and they act as a consultant for a specific product or service within a certain vertical or market. So large companies or more traditional companies, they're like, yeah, fine. That's great. Smaller companies and medium-sized business companies, especially in the tech world, they look at what I do and they're like, yeah, what is this? <laughs> I've had people, why would I ever? Really good example. I actually lost a contract this mm -hmm. summer for a SaaS company. The VP marketing, anyone who comes into my inbox is excited. They're like, they see the benefit. Usually they're like, yeah, I love the idea of having <coughs> external, professional, qualitative research to help understand our market, counter our biases, Help me get a roadmap in place, what have you. So the VP marketing was excited. The VP of product in one of their meetings when I got pitched was like, why in the world do we ever have someone outside talk to our customers? Our product team already does mm -hmm. this. That's another one I get. We already do this. Sales does this, product does this. And that's great. But what they're seeing is at a contextual point in time of where the relationship sits now. The product team already has a customer they're working with and did they did not see everything they went through over the past maybe two years to move in market so <clears throat> i get the converted i get people love it the challenge they face is they have to go mm -hmm. and sell it and it doesn't always work in my favor but i'm running <clears throat> right now three projects for companies and they're like yeah. they're all in especially for marketers that i'm a vp marketer fractional cmo 
as they're doing, say some of the things you described, which is like talking to product, talking to sales, talking to the C-suite, getting the lay of the land in their first 90 days. I then get brought in, okay, I don't have to actually have time to go and talk to the market as a whole, understand that, do competitive analysis, talk to buyers, you mm -hmm. go do that. Because I know I can get it done probably in four to six weeks. So by the time they need it for their 90 day, like strategy. Yeah, yeah. So talk to us about this angle of investigation. What do you mean by customer investigations and how was your approach different from a normal customer research or market research? Yeah. I don't know if I'm different, maybe I'm different than market research within the category of market research. So sort of there, I'm in very much like mm. I zoom in market research historically <clears throat> people see as like a high level thing how many what's the market opportunity for SaaS vendors in health tech that do this type total of total addressable market and all that stuff or yeah total social market all that stuff i zero in okay if you have an ideal client i want to understand how they make decisions and how they think which is key how do they think what are the words they use so the investigative process, the process of, if you look at any type of investigative process, or you look at qualitative research is what I do. And there's different types of qualitative research processes. When you will it all down, it's all like thematic analysis patterns and trying to understand how things, things have mm -hmm. unfolded over time, the actions people took, the behaviors that they exhibited. I don't care about opinions or whether you like a thing. I just want to understand like what they did. So how I'm different, I think, than how other people would approach it. Cause I've seen this, I've seen people do it. And often it's about opinions and their biases taking hold. What I try to do is I mentioned earlier about the process. Say I'm <coughs> GitHub. GitHub is not the process of software development. It just supports it. So I would want to start at the point where, okay. CTO or head of X, <clears throat> take me to the time point where you started, take me to the point where, where you were storing your code was not working for you or however your process was for whatever your process was for storing your code. Let's start there. What were you thinking? You know, I was thinking this, okay, what did you do next? You know, that's probably the best example because everyone in the world uses it yet, <laughs> but if I'm looking for a CRM, it's the same thing. I was using Excel spreadsheets. I was using pipe drive and then I moved to HubSpot. Okay. Let's start at the beginning. When did you, what was happening that made you think what was happening that made you want to make a change? Oh, this is how this was happening. Okay, great. What did you do next? And that's it. That's what I do. Cause if you look at processes of investigation, like an attorney or a lawyer or a detective or law enforcement. They'll say, okay, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You were here in this three quarter at 2.25 PM on Sunday. What happened? What happened next? Yeah. What happened next? That's what I do. It sounds so silly, but I'm trying to get to that point of what was the actual journey they took and what decisions did they make and how did they think about the, all, all their options? Of yeah. That's, that's probably what's different about me. It's very, yeah, that's really good. And I have a follow-up question because what I find most times it's okay. I, what, what I typically do is tell my client, okay, we're going to need to interview maximum six months old customers who have their memory fresh, but that's yeah. not always possible. How do you have any <coughs> strategy for jogging their memories when you interview yeah. them? Yeah. So, cause I guess you're, what you're getting at is people who have been yeah, customers exactly. longer, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're saying, sir, right? I agree with you. You want six months. Because what we want to unlock is people's mm. recall and recall is stronger, the closer it was to the events that happened. As you move through time, people's memories fade. How memory is also not always reliable after a long period of time, because memory is actually, um, memories change over time based on your actually current and present scenario. So what you thought was a blue car three years ago might actually have been a red car. You should have seen blue cars everywhere yeah. now. Right. So <clears throat> yeah, you have to get it as close as you can. If you cannot, to your question, it's you take them through the process that I just outlined, where you start at the beginning of a decision they made and you try to get them to move through 
every decision. And the key thing is, first, you, you have to, what people will do when you ask a question or anything like that is they jump through time very mm, quickly yeah. or they'll cover a lot of ground. So they'll cover six months within one answer. And your job as the person who's trying to understand how they made decisions is you take them back <clears throat> to where they just jumped the timeline. So good example. You, so let's start with the CRM, either spreadsheets and you wanted to move to your CRM. What did you do first? What'd you do next? Oh, pipe drive and then it was an upspot. Let your Salesforce, Salesforce too expensive. I talked to the CFO and a few months later, we, we liked HubSpot and we mm. chose that. Okay, great. <laughs> Probably like in a span of eight months. Let's go back. <laughs> yeah, let's go back. So you said you saw a pipe drive. What did you, what were you looking for with them? Or even better, how did you find mm. them? What made you look at them? And then you just keep going back and forth. So that's the key thing is people. Your job is the researcher is to stop them from rushing through and bring them back and figure out like actions, behaviors, yeah. because if you do that, their recall starts to get activated stronger and you'll hear things at like minute 20, minute 23, you know what? You just made me remember this thing and I want to tell you before I forget. So yeah, that's the key one is you, if you, the more you can attach things to a story or a process the easier it is for them to, to bring things back mm -hmm. in their brain and give it to yeah. you. I'm curious when it comes to selecting customers to interview, apart from recency, what other factors do you keep into considerations? And because, so I can ask my clients, I typically ask six months old, also the sales team knows who their best customers, ideal customers are. So I might have them chime in. What are other factors that you take into <coughs> account to, to know who to speak to? I work backwards from what I want to understand. So maybe the best customers is, is something I actually don't care about because they, they don't meet the mm. objective. Maybe what I want to talk to is people who have actually churned in the last six, three months, or the best customers are always the best ones to talk to because they're going to be raw. Sure. But maybe I want to talk to people that actually almost didn't choose mm. us. I don't know how you find those, right? But it all depends if I want to improve certain elements of why a certain piece of the product is not getting adopted or used, then I want to go find people that aren't yeah. using it, right? Or maybe the other one are using it. If I, maybe I don't want to talk to customers, maybe I want to talk to buyers because what I want to do is actually get a lay of how people evaluate the categories and options in market. So there's a whole, you know, best customers are ready for case studies, mm -hmm. testimonials. So maybe I do want to talk yeah. to them. So it's all relative to what I want to understand. And I work backwards from that, the objective. It's really, what is something that's we're failing to do or we want to improve in our business? How, what's the insights we need to do mm. that? And then we go figure out who to talk to. And it doesn't necessarily have to be one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's other ways to get the information you need if it's going to feed into the objective. But if it is converse, one-on-one -on -one conversations, you need to figure out, it's, I always like to work backwards from what it is we're trying yeah. to achieve. And does that objective changes? Like every project, does it have its own custom objective and you adapt your process or how does it work for you? Not so much for me because I'm very focused on acquisition, yeah. B2B acquisition. I, there are people who do what I do that focus on like retention, mm. product led yeah. type researchers that do qualitative research. There's, I don't do that. There's great ones out there. When people are curious who I would recommend, they can always just ping in the LinkedIn, happy to give some of those recommendations. It, it's all <clears throat> relative to what people want, the information they want to get. Now, that's to say, sometimes I'll do, do one right now where it's for the finance industry, large company, they deal with large banks, and it's often multiple stakeholders involved in a deal because these deals are hundreds of thousands of dollars. What they want is actually more around trends and analysis and points of view from executive of like, what's coming, what are they worried about in the next two years? Where do they think the winds are blowing in the market? Because that is actually sometimes the start of the acquisition process from like thought leadership and strategic narrative and all those things. So it's all relative to what you yeah, want to know. Yeah. I'm curious about 
the specific questions and the flow of questions. Do you have a template that you use and then customize, or do you have a couple of main questions and then you, it's pretty much like free flowing? How do you go about it? Yes and no. Questions are funny. Having specific questions are interesting are funny because they can be a crutch, but they also help you get started. Really good example. When I started as an, or as a reporter, I just had like my better questions. These are the good ones. And <clears throat> a few things can happen in that environment when you're not experienced. The key one is you focus so much on making sure you ask the questions in the order you've written them that you forget to actually actively listen to what's going on in the conversation. But that's often for people who haven't done a lot of this work. And that was me at that one point in time. So the challenge though, is if you haven't done a lot of this work, the question, it's hard to do this without having questions. So why am I saying all this? If you look at people who are experienced researchers, they often don't have a list of questions and I don't either. What I have is a list of topics and themes that I want to cover mm. <clears throat> because that's, I want to allow room for people, for the conversation to breathe because insights often don't live in a question. And you would probably know this from based on you now how many conversations you have, because it's a similar format insights live in the follow-up questions. Cause yeah. I might say something you're like, oh, that's interesting. I never, like you're thinking, you're, I never thought of that. I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. That's often your job as a researcher is just to keep digging. <clears throat> so I do have a list of question, templated questions on mm -hmm. my website, contentleft.io for various types of conversations that you might have going back to what's your objective and what do you want to accomplish? If it's UI UX or sales enablement or whatever, right? <clears throat> so I have them all bucketed out. As you do more of this work, what you will find is the questions start to drop away and more high level conversational themes will take their place. What, what do you and mean? Real creative. What do you mean by, by higher level yeah. conversational themes? So <clears throat> for example, um, let me pull up one because I'm mm -hmm. working on it now. So I might ask specific questions, but what I want to may want to know is walk me through your role. What are you focused on? What are you prioritizing your time on over the next yeah. quarter? So that's a question, but it's more about, you can see how expansive yeah, yeah. that might be. And then I'm going to ask follow-up questions within that, right? So one I'm doing right now for a, co a company that is in the collaborative tools space. So thinking uh, Miro, mm -hmm. uh, white, digital whiteboard type stuff. So what are, my starting point is. I want to walk you, I want to walk through your career process for conducting collaborative workshops. Where does, how do you get the ideas for what do you want to cover in them? Let's start yeah, there. Okay. How do you get to key decisions and key actions in meetings? What's the process for that? So it's a starting yeah. point because it's an open-ended question and I'm going to ask a whole bunch of new follow-up questions. What I've done though, is what I know is I have like a, a, a framework scheme of what I think the process might already mm -hmm. be. So I can guide the conversation, yeah. but I'd like, that's what I mean by high level, more higher level parts of the conversation. And I might focus on five to 10 minutes on one of those topics. And then when I know I've gotten enough, <coughs> I move on to the next thing that I want yeah. to cover. I hope I answered yeah. the question. Let me know if I wasn't clear. Yeah, yeah absolutely. When you ask one of those questions, do you go in expecting some kind of answers typically, or is it always surprising and you just follow where the conversation goes? It's a bit of both. I try to have <coughs> my clients walk me through what they believe to okay, be true. Okay, so you have assumptions. But I don't, yeah, but I don't use that. I, I keep my biases at the door mm. and I just, it's all very open-ended. I don't plant seeds. I don't lead. I don't say, are you trying this too? I might say, is there anything else that you've tried? Yeah. yeah. That's a different way of asking the same, getting the same thing. Cause I'm not leading them. I try to keep all assumption and biases at the door, but I, because I'm in a, a third party exterior consultant, I still need a baseline of how something works. Right. So I can, the only reason is that way I can make sure that I've covered what we believe to be are the various stages of something, or I can make sure that as I'm getting to minute 37, 
and I haven't covered off maybe some of the tech stack they use. Like, oh crap, I haven't, mm. we haven't talked about that yet. Because people sometimes answer, yeah. you've probably seen it. I do this. I'm a long way. Yeah, you have the, one answer could be you, five you have minutes. the one word replies or the, the guys that take ages or, or in between. Yeah. <laughs> Every human is different. So you're navigating that part of it too. So I keep these themes in the topics because then I know, okay, if I haven't covered off tech stack yet and we're getting close to the last 10 minutes, I got to yeah. pivot really quick so I can make sure I can at least get one question. When it comes to the people who just reply with one word or a quick sentence, <laughs> do you try and force them to get something more out of all of them or just um, finish the interview early? Yeah, I wouldn't call it, yeah, I wouldn't call it force. I call it like, I just kept keep re-asking the same uh, question in a different way. Yeah. And <clears throat> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes so you get people that this is how they are. Now, I think in my experience, you don't get too many of those because those types of people, this environment isn't really appealing mm. to them. <laughs> so they, they often shy away from these types of interactions, but you'll get them. You do your best. And if you don't get anything you need from someone, sometimes I've had a 20 minute conversation when I was hoping to have a 45, I just find another person yeah. to talk to. You mentioned biases, so co cognitive biases. And I know like from my experience, when I was a UX lead writing usability testing questions, it's, you have to be very deliberate in how you avoid being leading and yeah, leading to conclusions that you don't want to get to yet. So how would you advise marketers counter their own biases and become better interviewers? A lot of it is some of the things I've covered, which is don't opinions, don't focus on opinions. It's subjective. Why you, and people are, don't go, don't ask hypotheticals. Don't ask, what would you do? What could you have? Those things don't exist. And you have to be very careful because <clears throat> when you're comparing subjectives, people will describe them differently. What you want are, what did you do? What have you done? Who did you talk to about this? What did you talk about? Very, we want objective, we want objectivity. Mm. Keep your questions open. Don't lead, don't ask like, if they tried something, what did they try? Open any questions. And that's why I really like following the narrative because when you have a narrative or you're trying to uncover a narrative, it reduces the amount of subjectivity that creeps into the conversation by nature. Mm. Those, that's how I like to yeah. do it, but there's other, some other things, but I think those are the mm. key, the key ones. Uh, sometimes I realize at least for myself that the more research work I do before going into interviews, the more bias I might be. So I, I was curious, what kind of research or information gathering do you do before getting into interviews? My typical flow is <clears throat> I try to go through a customer's website, try to understand a bit more about who their ideal customer is. I'll go through a few Reddit posts, a few communities, a few competitors. And then I just have a conversation around, tell me, I ask them, tell me about what you want to learn. What are people doing now? What other things are they using in, in addition to you or instead of you? Why do you think people may or may not be buying you? And that's really it because again, what I care about is a process of something. So if we go back to the, one of the projects, I'm not sure, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but I got asked to, by the CEO to, to do some market analysis on long haul trucking and they had built a solution for insurance. And the first thing I asked the CEO is, okay, how does the process of long haul trucking work? And their software tool was a communication tools aggregator. So it's like, you could plug in Slack and Facebook messenger and phone and email and all just go mm -hmm. send desks type thing, but for insurance. <coughs> and I asked him, how does long haul trucking work? Uh, and you want to sell into it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's go figure out how it works. So my post today was about that. Like talking about how I just want to figure out, okay, well, let's talk about how the process works, but more importantly, how do they communicate within that process with each other? What are the tools they use? What are the challenges of the communication? What's working? What's not? Yeah. What's most important to talk Mm -hmm. It's like that. So <clears throat> that's the process I use because then it's not so much about the product. It's about how does, what are the solutions they're using already? And do we map against yeah, it? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, talking specifically about different personas, 
how do you think about yeah. crafting ideal persona profiles? And, and I know that you also have a, an interesting take on, on roles and titles, right? For personas. Yeah. So personas get a bad rap and it's unfortunate. And I think they get a bad rap because is it, when you look at consumer, <clears throat> I think we try to appropriate consumer personas and we use them in a B2B mm. setting. So education, income, <clears throat> demographics, yeah. geography, and that stuff is, it, it's a start. <clears throat> but if you go back to what I said about like consumer versus B2C versus B2B, consumer products don't carry a lot of risk. There's not a lot of consideration to them. If I buy, if I like Perrier and I buy liquid death can water, I don't like it. I'm out a few bucks. <clears throat> and the amount of information I need to decide whether you're going to make that purchase, isn't there's not a lot of depth to that. It's whether it fits with me or it doesn't personally. In a business environment, <clears throat> it's inherently more complex because there are more, there are what we call considered decisions. There's often multiple stakeholders. The price points are high. There's more risk because people can get fired if the wrong tool or lose their jobs, if, especially if it's a lot of money. So there's, and that, that's not a panacea. It's, there's a spectrum of these things. If I am using <coughs> a calendar schedule, whether I use Google Meet or Calendly, but there's less sort of consideration there. But if for a CRM, for a company that wants to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, there's a lot of work that goes in that decision. So what does that have to do with personas? <coughs> the amount of information you need as a marker then to influence everything that goes on in that decision, there's more is, has mm. more depth. So I like, I've used, I like personas and I built them myself that have that level of depth around all the things I've just discussed, where I'm like, why you would use it, how, who our competitors are, how does it fit contextually? How do they find success and so on? So I can't remember the second part of your question. I remember I'm forgetting, but I think it was around. Yeah. yeah mentioning role and yeah, oh yeah, role, role title. title. So <clears throat> the challenge you run into in B2B is that people just make up titles. Yeah. <laughs> right. They're, they make them up all the time. And I run to this consistently because I, I do a lot of research recruitment and what someone who is a director of innovation at a startup is different than somebody who's the director of innovation at a fortune 1000 company like Nike. Yeah. Like it, they're just not the same because what they're going to be working on is going to be totally different. There might be some overlaps, <coughs> but they're different. What you need to focus on is like the problems people yeah. own and what are they trying to solve? Because for a CRM, right? If I'm HubSpot, it could be a chief revenue officer, it could be marketing operations lead. It could be whoever, right? That the director of marketing, those are different roles, but they probably want to all solve the same problem because it's a business and they have processes that they need to fix and get better at. So yeah, titles are like bad data points and that's, but that's like the top thing we use in our outreach. Like we're going to talk, we're going to sell this, we're going to sell to CTOs. Well, what type of CTO? What size of company? What are the, what, what's their vertical? What's their business model? That's the stuff that makes sense because if I'm a CTO at a hospital, how I look at solutions can be different than if I'm the CTO at Google. Yeah. When it comes to reaching these people, right? So these are high profile people. One of the biggest problems in B2B and maybe also one of the challenges in getting buy-in for interviews as well, it's getting these people on interviews. So do you have any strategies or advice for how to get people on interviews, incentives or any other tactics to use? Yeah. It's funny. My thoughts on this has evolved over the last few years as I've been doing this work. Before I would have said, <laughs> you don't need incentives. You don't need to you get things to people to, to get time on their calendar. I don't think that's the case anymore. I look at it this way. Now, if you want to talk to customers and even if they want to talk to you, they're busy, they probably say, yeah, I want to help. Guess what? They have a life and other things they are doing and you are not a priority. The first thing you need to do is have a follow up with them at least more than once. Cause they might even see the message and it registers. Oh yes, Chris, I remember, yeah, I want to help you. And then life mm. gets in the way. So I usually follow up at least a minimum of five times before I count them as like not, they can't book. I, I can't get them to book yeah. for the sample. 
if you have a customer, think about doing something for them for their time, whatever you think that is, swag, gift, charitable donation, straight up gift card payment, <coughs> don't care. Show them reciprocity for their time. And you don't even have to tell them you can do it. That's, that's fun with a message, a great customer service yeah. strategy, right? They're like, happy to talk to you, they talk to you. And then you send them a thing You're like, oh my God, amazing. Thank you so much. It's great. I'm, I'm so glad we're business partners. <clears throat> if you're going to people who are not your customers, you got to pay them. Yeah. It just, one, it's going to be faster. You're going to have better data <clears throat> and you have a better chance of like getting the insights you need that turn into actions to help the mm. business. So, yeah, it's number one, Chris, like the top challenge. And I'm, I'm writing to this now <clears throat> with a client because I've run into it time and time again, they'll send an email out from the sales team or whoever. And I ask them, <clears throat> can I do some follow-ups? Oh, no, we got yeah. it. <laughs> and then they've sent one email out a week goes by. I said, and I, follow up with my client, no one's booked, no one's booked. I have two people book. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll send a follow up next week. Have you sent a follow up? I haven't sent it. Because it's just, even though they're blasting a thousand people, life gets yeah, in the way. Yeah. So yeah, follow up a lot, try to incentivize as best you can and make sure <coughs> you really pick the right yeah. people. Do you get a lot of no shows or do you have ways to avoid them? Yeah, I do. Not really, as in ways to avoid them, it happens. I would say it's one out of 10, not even maybe yeah, like one out of good. 20. But again, it's, if life gets in the way, right? It's hard for people. So I just, I say, I usually just keep on them to try and get them on my calendar. Yeah. <laughs> and if I have enough, but I also will keep trying to find new people, right? Cause I can't wait for them. The worst thing you want is for these things to take six months. I talked to someone. A few weeks ago, she said she spent six figures for a project that took six to eight mm -hmm. months. And just <laughs> that's too long because guess what? That's almost two quarters and the market could have yeah, totally exactly. changed. That yeah. Time. Yeah. I can, by incentivizing now and, and getting people, I can usually get things turned around in four yeah, weeks. Yeah. Are you more of the camp of offering them as many alternatives of communication as possible? Either a Zoom or yes. phone or are you just with one and that's it? <clears throat> a thousand percent to make, for, make it easy for yeah. them because you're taking up their time. Yeah. I have people I've had, I had to do a, a project with someone last year where I, I had to re talk to structural engineers. <laughs> These people are not technically inclined. <laughs> I'm making a huge generalization. <clears throat> if you go to their websites, it's, they haven't been updated since 1997. So most of them. Some of them couldn't use Gmail, didn't know how, didn't have Zoom. So I had to call them and then I would record the phone call. But that's okay because that's all I need to do is talk to them. Don't need to see them. Just yeah, talk yeah. To them. All right. So you've done your interviews. How many interviews do you typically do, <coughs> ideally, for a project? Yeah. So this is where people debate. The term in qualitative research that you're looking for is something called insight saturation which is different than statistical relevancy, which you get from quantitative mm -hmm. research, right? So if I'm doing surveys, there's a margin of error. I want a certain number to account for X, Y, Z. In qualitative research is different because it's thematic analysis and narrative and all those things I discussed earlier. There are peer reviewed studies on the ideal sample sizes for qualitative research. I've read them. You all don't have to read them. They're super boring. I've read them for you. And in with the term insight saturation, where that the later, the lay way to explain that is you start hearing the same things over and over again in, in any conversation from different people. If you plotted those learnings on a bell curve, it starts to dip around seven mm. conversations, which isn't a lot. By the time you've hit 15, you've probably captured 99% of the learnings. Now you can keep going because the bell curve flattens out and you'll learn probably small things incrementally at interview 40. But what's your time worth and how often and how quickly do you need to action the insights you're learning? <clears throat> I like the 12 range. The key thing is there's two caveats to that. One is you have to have your firmographics and site graphics and segmentation parameters locked down mm. tight. 
So that's why I said before, if I'm the CTO of a hospital and the CTO of Google, I'm not talking to them in the same project based on what my objectives yeah. are. And because they're different businesses. Is altogether. that 12 per persona or 12 in total? Uh, yeah. 12 per okay. persona. So if I'm going into a new market or there's, I have a product where there's multiple users or I teach customer discovery here at Incubator where I am in Auto Canada, I try to validate different market segments. And it's maybe I do think that I could sell to a CTO at a hospital and a CTO for a large company like Google. Then I have to talk to 12 in each of those types of business models and similar size and as apples to apples as I'm asking get it. So there it'd be like 20. Because <clears throat> if you mix and match in B2B, it ain't going to work. All right. Because the lens through which they solve problems with for their business model and, and bring in business partners is going to be different based on a whole different type of a bunch of yeah, variables. Yeah. So that's where <clears throat> you just have to increase your sample sizes and segment them properly. But if you have a really core good customer and you want to learn more about them, even seven mm. will get you a ton yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and it's pretty doable for most companies. Yeah, it's not a huge lift. Yeah. And a lot of the re a lot of the literature for the last four years, <clears throat> when it comes to business validation and UI UX people, I had UX people push back on <laughs> me on this all the time. 40, 50 interviews, sure. But based on what type of users and what are the firmographic, set of graphics and the identity of these users. Right. Because if it's a HubSpot, yeah, the marketing ops person who's working with the content person and the sales lead or the CRO, they're all working together in the thing. But you, so you would have 40 interviews, just each segment. Yeah. And, and it's also a bit different. I find for usability oriented interviews, where you have to start seeing patterns and improve interfaces versus qualitative exactly. insights on decision-making. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell you as person, they shouldn't yeah. do that. Like if they want to do it. All I'm saying is the data suggests over the last, in the academic or last few years, you might not need to do as many yeah. as you think, but it's a gut check call at the yeah. end of the day. Love it. My last question is, so in order to conduct a customer interview, especially at this level, you need to be curious. So how do you keep yourself curious? <laughs> oh gosh. I think that's just in my DNA. And I wish there was a better answer. Than <laughs> you were more curious. I was seeing my son just a thousand questions a day. I was the same. He just, I just need to understand how things work. Yeah. I'm just, it's in my blood. I just need to understand how people think and how they work. And if you don't have, that's okay. You just have to figure out how to tap into that. And whether that's empathy or you just find a commonality with these people, it's, that's the job is you're curious, yes. but maybe an, another way to look at it, Chris is like, if there's something you really want to get done in the business and this can help you use that as your driving energy in the gas in the mm. tank, you know what, <clears throat> because this is draining for people. I can do this all day. I love my job. I can have conversations all day with people, right? Again, part of it is just I grew up in the hospitality industry. Yeah. So it's, it ain't no thing for me to just call like my battery for to social interaction is yeah. pretty high. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Not everyone's mm. like that. So I understand. So just find the ways to see yourself. You know what? I only have to have seven conversations and it'll help me achieve this thing so I can yeah. get through it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's been amazing. Lots of great stuff. Oh, well, thank you. That I, as well, I can take into my work. So where can people find you? So you're on LinkedIn, you're on your website, contentlift.io, yeah. and you have two yeah. cool things to share with people, right? Uh, a DIY yeah, guide I'm, on interviews? Yeah, yeah, my DIY guide. It's basically everything in the brain in a, I call, it's a course, really, online course, but I call yeah. it a guide. It's everything I know over 22 years, and it's really geared for like marketers and B2B and salespeople, right? Cool. And the other thing was customer interview questions. Yeah, you mentioned. So there's a yeah. huge, it, oh, it's actually a post, <laughs> so you don't have to opt in or anything, and you can get all these questions. Yeah, no, and it's free. It's a free resource on my site. You can download yep. it if you want, but I have it there. Like, I'm not a big gate person. Um, I'm a big believer. Like, I, I live in the brand marketing mm. philosophy. It's if you give value in B2B, people yeah. will remember that. 
and I can see it because that thing gets shared without my knowing. I know it because I see the traffic <laughs> and I know people share yeah. it with each other. So I've done my job, right? Or I'm associated with the amount of times I get tagged in posts about customer interviews and customer research is bananas. I didn't expect yeah, it. Yeah, and, and I guess that, right? that's the power so, of being so like focused on a specific area as well of research. Yeah, but I also know how these things yeah. work because I've investigated hundreds and hundreds of B2B buying journeys. So I understand the nuances at a high level, how this thing works. So yeah, but it's there, it's a free resource. It, it, it's, it will help you get started if you're really struggling with this work or you're just stuck at that, the cold start problem yeah. of how to get going yeah. with this. So yeah, everyone's welcome to go grab it. Right, awesome, Raya. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been great, Cheers. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the pod. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, the best thing you could do to support the show and help me as a small business owner would be to leave a review. Head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and let me know what you think. If you don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe. And if you have any feedback, questions or suggestions for future episodes, just hit me up on LinkedIn at Christopher Silvestri or Twitter at Silvestri Chris. Speak to you next time.